chapter 4 is perhaps one of the most well-known passages in the Gospel of Matthew because it is dealing with the testing or the temptation of Jesus Christ, of Jesus the man, the temptation of Jesus as it is known. The past dozen years, we have become familiar with the phrase, holy war. You think about it, before, before the year 2000, how many of you actually heard or thought about the phrase, holy war? But since 9-11, we have become all too familiar. But in reality, the term holy war is not new at all. God called Israel to holy war in the Old Testament. Holy war for Israel was divinely initiated. God engages those who oppose him, those who are opposed to him. God engages at times more forcefully than at others. God is gracious, no doubt, very gracious, in that He allows time to repent. He sends the rain and the sunshine. He causes the crops to grow. He grants well-being to people, but everything is ordered in God's timetable. He sovereignly engages those in opposition to His holiness. God is a warrior. There's a book on my shelf by a gentleman, the title of the book, God is Warrior. He is indeed a warrior. He is gracious, but he is also a warrior. In the church of Jesus Christ, you and I, we also are engaged in a vicious spiritual warfare. And our battle is not against humanity. It is against the rulers and against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenlies, as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 6. The Christian life is a war. Steve Lawson, in his good book, Faith Under Fire, says the Christian life is a war, not a playground for children, but a battleground for soldiers. Indeed, that is true. Behold your king, is the theme of the Gospel of Matthew. Quoting from Zechariah chapter 9, in Matthew 21, Jesus' triumphal entry into the Jerusalem. People bow down and say, hallelujah to the king. Behold your king. That's Matthew's desire. That his readers, his Jewish readers would understand and embrace their king. And with that purpose set before him... Matthew selects and arranges events from the life of Jesus to accomplish his purpose. Every writer does this in the New Testament. That's why Matthew says things a little bit differently than Mark and Luke and John, for example. They're writing to different people. They have different purposes for writing. Each gospel is not intended to be an exhaustive life of Christ, not intended to be chronological or not. Matthew knows the connection to the Old Testament scriptures is one of the keys. And so he included over 100 Old Testament references. And some are fulfilled in the person of Jesus, such as Isaiah 7, 14 and chapter 1 of Matthew. And others are illustrative in some way. God's covenant with David. Remember 2 Samuel chapter 7. That covenant with David represents one of the theological high points of all of Old Testament Scripture. And that is the theological underpinning in Matthew. It is the structure like a bridge going out across the water. It's what you do not see. What we see is what Matthew says. The structure upholding that is that Davidic covenant. From David will come one, a ruler who will rule in righteousness. Behold, this is him. Behold your king. The style and the vocabulary of this gospel is very Jewish. Jewish rituals and customs are not explained. And the author is familiar with geography and the climate of Israel. All of these point to a very Jewish gospel. This gospel is an apologetic. It is written primarily to unsaved Jews. 
And the purpose, of course, is to win them to Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. Matthew is the systematic argument that Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is Messiah. This systematic argument, this apologetic. And he has listed proofs, several proofs already in this gospel. He has presented to us the legal lineage of Jesus, that is, his ancestry, establishing his right to the throne of David. That's a genealogy. He's told us of the supernatural origin of Jesus in chapter 1, verses 18 through 25, establishing his deity. He is more than a mere human descendant of David. He is indeed God in the flesh, the God-man. He's made the case for his place of birth and the Gentile testimony in the first part of chapter 2. Proof from the place of birth. How he was born was a fulfillment of prophecy. We saw that at the end of chapter 1 in verses 22 and 23. Not only that, but where he was born was a fulfillment of prophecy as well. In Bethlehem. Micah 5.2 we think about. The birth of the king had worldwide impact. Birth of the king was a gift to Israel and to the world as evidenced by the Gentile testimony. And then we've seen the providential interference for the child's protection. And again, that is connected to Old Testament scripture in chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. The conclusion of each segment, Matthew introduces a text from the Old Testament in support of that particular section of the narrative. There in 2, verses 13 through 23. The providential interference. God is protecting his son. And we also have the prophetic pronouncement in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. A herald, John the Baptist, of prophetic proportions, the son of... Of John, the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth. John was the forerunner. The king's ambassador sent ahead to lay out the red carpet and prepare the way. He's calling to Israel, repent, respond to your king. Prepare yourself for the king who is coming, was his message. Then he gave us a warning of judgment. To all who have misplaced objects of faith. To all who look to something other than the king. To all who look to ritual, ceremony, pedigree, if you will, being a Jew. John knows this and he fires back at them, anticipating what they will say by saying this. Now look, don't you even think. Don't you suppose that being a Jew, having Abraham as your father is going to do you any good? Is what he says to them. The warning of judgment. The Messiah is king. He is Lord. He does not share his glory. And then there's the father's approval and the anointing of Jesus in chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Matthew is... Introducing Jesus as the Messiah, King of Israel, fulfilling the anticipatory prophecy of the Old Testament and confirmed by the voice of the Father from heaven as God's beloved Son. This is Him. Listen to Him. This is Him in whom I am well pleased. And you have the anointing, the Spirit coming down as a dove, like a dove, descending upon Him. This is the anointing. Of Jesus for his ministry. His ministry begins. And the first. The first act of his ministry. Is going to be. Perhaps his most difficult test. Perhaps his most difficult test. Now all of these proofs. That we've listed here. Cannot be overthrown. Even in a. Single case by case consideration. Even if we were to try to separate all of these, they are all of them airtight. And you put them all together, Matthew's argument is deafening to doubters and he silences the critics. There is no way out of this. The the Jew who's reading this must flat out reject what is being said because he cannot refute it. He cannot contradict it. Scripture is too clear. 
There are too many proofs that what Matthew is writing is true, that Jesus is the anointed one who was promised. It is flawless. It is airtight. It is sufficient. Get this. It is sufficient to convince and condemn anyone who receives or rejects this message. Is it not? You read Matthew 1, 2, and 3, and you reject what is saying, it is sufficient to condemn you. That's how airtight it is. You welcome and receive and believe what is said here in Matthews 1, 2, and 3. It is sufficient to grant life. It is that good. It is that solid. It is that true, what Matthew says here. And, of course, that's true for all of Scripture. It's all inspired. God breathed. And we know this, of course, as we just said, because this gospel is included in all Scripture that is God-breathed. But God has more. There is more here. Divine providence would have one more argument or proof to have, to include for us. This section that we're going to look at, begin to look at this morning, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, is called the temptation of the king, the temptation of Jesus. All three Gospels give some record of this event. All three Gospels give some record of this event. Mark is the most brief of all the accounts in the three Gospels, or in all the Gospels. Matthew is unique in this sense. In other words, he is different than all the other Gospels in this sense. Matthew gives the express purpose for which the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. And that express purpose is, you see it, to be tempted by the devil. It's not that the other Gospels deny that, but you have an express, expressly stated purpose here in the Gospel of Matthew. And that's unique to Matthew's Gospel. So an outline might look very simple, might look something like this. In the verses 1 and 2, you have the holy arrangement. And it's holy arrangement because who was Jesus led up by? The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit led him up. This is a divine, holy arrangement. This is not an accident. This is not Satan bushwhacking Jesus. This is not an unsuccessful ambush attempt. This is determined by the Father. So you have the holy arrangement, or if you want to look at it from the Satan's perspective, it's the setup. And then verses 3 through 10 is the test. The Father is putting his Son under the test. Or from Satan's perspective, this is the temptation. You see, test and temptation are the same Greek word. It depends on how it's used in the context. It's a neutral word. And if it's in a positive context, it's a test. If it's in a negative context, it's a temptation. So from the holy arrangement side, the, the God's perspective, it is a test. From Satan's perspective, it is a temptation. And then verse four and verse uh, chapter four and verse eleven is the victory, or from Satan's perspective, Jesus tells him to be gone, the departure of the unholy. So the outline attempts to show both sides of the conflict. It's most known or most well known as the temptation of Jesus Christ. Matthew's reason for including this event was to add to an already formidable list of proofs that we just looked at. We have one more to strengthen his case for Jesus being the anointed one. The setup, the temptation and the departure of Satan are what happened. The cause of what happened is reflected in the holy arrangement, the test and the victory. It was God behind all of this. We take Satan out of the picture as far as him initiating anything. He is not initiating anything. God is initiating everything here. 
So the cause of what happened is reflected in the holy arrangement, the test, and the victory. God was in complete control. He is the master of ceremonies throughout this whole event. So what was the purpose of the test or the temptation? Really two parts. Jesus authenticates the Father's endorsement. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, he says at the end of chapter 3. And Jesus is going to authenticate the father's endorsement. He was anointed and his ministry began here at this point, And he's going to prove that he is worthy to accomplish and fulfill the acts and the deeds that the father has for him. To Jews... Reading here is proof of authority to reign. He overcame. He is victorious. Jesus proved that he was worthy to receive and to reign over the kingdom of his father, that his father would give to him. Here is proof. And there have, you think about it, there have been two representatives of humanity. You know who those are. There has been Adam and Jesus. Adam was one who was created innocent. He was an innocent one, not a perfect one. He was innocent. He failed. And as a result of his failure, dominion over creation was lost. Man's dominion over creation was lost because of that sin. Question is now is, will Jesus, a perfect one, not innocent, a perfect one, have victory? And according to Romans chapter 5 and verse 14, Christ is the greater Adam. So in Adam, all sinned. So Christ and what he did, all have the opportunity to believe. As Adam was tempted by Satan, so Jesus would be tempted by Satan. And we need to understand and perhaps just remind ourselves that Jesus was not tempted so that the father could learn something about his son. It's a uh, ridiculous notion. He's already stated his approval. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The spirit has come down on him, anointing him for the ministry that the father has for him. So the father is not learning anything about his son through this testing here. The father had already given Jesus his divine approval. Jesus was tempted or was tested so that every creature in heaven, on earth, under the earth, might know that Christ the Lord is the conqueror. Not only will he do what Adam did not do here, he will defeat Satan. He will deliver the death blow. Satan will perhaps temporarily rejoice when Christ is on the cross Three days later will be the end when he raises from the dead and conquers death. And someday we will say, oh, death, where is your sting? It will all be behind us. So those are the reasons that the temptation is here and why Jesus needed to go through this testing. Every creature might know that Jesus Christ is the conqueror. He is king. All glory, all praise, all adoration. Every eye will behold him. Every knee will bow. The whole earth will praise him. And God is at this time and has been since since Acts chapter 2 gathering his church, the church of Jesus Christ, and he will cause that church to praise and worship his son, along with all Old Testament saints as well, praise and worship his son for all eternity. The father is gathering worshipers to worship his son. And we, you and I, are in the preparation stages of it. This worship that we do is the one thing that we will continue to do throughout all eternity. That includes singing too, by the way. So... Sharpen your vocal cords. It's only going to get better, for which most of us are glad. Let's look at this holy arrangement. This holy arrangement. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. 
And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. This is the arrangement. The same spirit who had just descended upon Jesus led him into the wilderness. There was little time between his baptism and being led into the wilderness. Mark has the word immediately, which is one of the key phrases in Mark. Evidently, it was, it was coming up out of the water, the, the confirmation from the Father, the Spirit descending upon him, and there was no, no talking or very little talking. And immediately, Mark says, he was led up by the Spirit. And in fact, Mark uses, the Gospel of Mark uses another term. This is in Mark chapter 1, verses uh, tw- uh, 13 and 14. Mark uses another strong word, the word impelled. And immediately the Spirit impelled him to go into the wilderness. The word impelled is a word used to describe Jesus driving out the money changers in Matthew 21. It was an, it was an impelling inner drive to go to the, wild, to go to the wilderness. Jesus knew immediately what the next step for him was going to be. And the Spirit of God enabling him, working through him, strengthening him, impelled him to go into the wilderness. The wilderness, that being hot, bearing, crumbling limestone, jagged ridges, a very desolate region. Wild animals were all over the place. There was nothing there. In fact, the surroundings between this region and the Garden of Eden are just the opposite. Adam sinned in luxury. Jesus must overcome in the harshest of climates. The same spirit who equipped Jesus for his messianic vocation led him into the wilderness where his unique sonship and vocation is going to be challenged by Satan. This purpose is specifically mentioned as being to be tempted by the devil. That's the uniqueness of Matthew's gospel. And note that the test did not begin until the end of the 40 days of fasting. Is it possible to live 40 days without food? Yes, it is. But not without water. Jesus must have had water with him. He was, and don't forget, he was fully man. Physical needs uh, were common to Jesus. He needed to eat. He needed to sleep. He was weary. They were common to him as, as any human. But it was not until the latter, of the very, not the very end, but the latter part of these days that the temptation uh, began. The text says to be tempted by the devil. It's the first time we've seen the enemy mentioned here in this gospel. If we look in the gospel of Matthew seven times, this enemy is described as the devil. He's also referred to Satan three times in this gospel. Beelzebul, remember that term? Twice in Matthew 10 and Matthew 12. And he's called tempter once. He's called the tempter once, and that's right here. It says in verse 3, And the tempter came and said to him, Is Satan real? Now, you never know that if you just ask somebody on the street. The question of whether Satan exists, believe it or not, hold on to your seats. The question of whether Satan exists is one of the most contentious theological debates around. Baffling, is it not? Those of us who grew up in church, those of us who are believers, did not even, have not even questioned, even, hasn't even, it hasn't even arose on the horizon whether Satan exists or not. But if you... Put any stock in the surveys, 
If you sit in college classes, philosophy classes and all kinds of things like that, you would see a overt attempt to unseat this thought that Satan or devil exists. You're familiar with that, I'm sure. A large percentage of Americans say they believe Satan is real. Other surveys say the opposite. Those who believe Satan is real always refer to him as a he. And most people, most believers believe that he is a fallen angel if they believe in him. Now, there are others who believe that Satan is a shapeless, malevolent force, some evil that floats around, the enemy of God. But there are also many people who believe that Satan is a myth and a dangerous myth. And that's where you get in in the college classes, a dangerous myth, because Satan's name, his name is often invoked or used to justify acts of violence. Now, beloved, it insults every fiber within creatures made in God's image to hear the word myth associated with Satan. Are we to believe that Jesus was tempted by a myth? A myth was the cause of humanity being plunged into sin. The myth that will be thrown out of heaven someday in the future, Revelation 12, 13. Is that really a myth? We introduced this message this morning. The introduction was talking about war, battle. If we believe Scripture, Scripture is true, which it, it, affirms, it, it, can, it affirms itself over and over and over. In Romans 8, His Spirit, the Spirit of God, affir- confirms with our spirit that we are the children of God. We cry out, Abba, Father. If Scripture is true, then Satan is real. He is very real, very much alive. But I would suggest to you that many people who profess to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who believe in a God, do not embrace that truth. So, if we were to read Ephesians 6, we would see that we are engaged in a vicious spiritual battle. And Paul even says our battle, our warring is not against what? It's not against people. My problem is not people. My problem, Ephesians 6, is that I am battling demons. I am battling spiritual beings who are extremely powerful. And there's a lot of them. And they have a lot of experience with people. We are engaged, indeed we are engaged in a vicious spiritual battle. And here are some of the reasons why we are engaged in this vicious spiritual battle. Now there, as a footnote, there are so many different ways you could approach Matthew 4. Matthew 4 can be approached looking at Satan and what he does. Matthew 4 can be approached and focused just on his tactics, for example, in the uh, temptations and what he says and how he uses scripture. And we'll get into a, a lot of those things. But this morning is the setup, the, the holy arrangement. And we need to understand who this devil is, who this tempter is, what scripture says about him. And we need to respect him because he is extremely powerful, extremely powerful. And there are many, many misunderstandings of Satan and spiritual warfare. And that alone is a series in itself. But there's no doubt that there is a demonic, satanic force battle that is going on. 
that is opposing us, that is opposing God, and that is opposing people. That doesn't mean everything that we, every kind of sin or every way that we sin, we blame it on Satan. No, no, no. This is not Flip Wilson theology. The devil made me do it. We battle our own flesh, the residue of the old man. We battle that. We battle Satan. We battle the fallenness of the world. But Satan is over the fallenness of the world. Just look at some of these reasons why we are engaged in a vicious spiritual battle. First of all, Satan is a real enemy. He is a real enemy. Maybe I'm preaching to the choir here. There's no reason that exists here to interpret any of these events as symbolic. The baptism was literal. The wilderness is literal. The spirit is real. There's no reason to see any of these things here as being symbolic. He really did go underwater. There really was a voice. The spirit really did descend. And he really did go into the wilderness. And there really is a devil. The Bible nowhere presents an argument for the existence of God, nor does the Bible give a detailed explanation for the origin of Satan, other than he was created by God. That's all Scripture says about his origin. He was created by God. He attempted to unseat God, likely sometime before creation. He continues to try to turn believers against God and God against believers. And where we would we turn in Scripture to see that example? Job chapter 1 and 2. Job chapter 1 and 2 is an attempt to turn God against people who follow him and turn people who follow God against him. Job chapter 1 and 2. It's right there. It's just as plain as the words on your paper. Satan tried to destroy the messianic line recorded in the book of Esther. He was behind the efforts to kill Jesus when Jesus was an infant. He tried to derail Jesus' ministry here on earth, whether it be trying to kill him before the appointed time of the father or whether it was trying through the people to exalt him as their king before the appointed time of the father. Either way, would be to derail the Father's plan. So never forget, Satan hates you and he has a terrible plan for your life. He is a constant and real enemy. Constant and real enemy. Satan is a deadly deceiver as well. He is a master of deception Appearing even, uh, appearing, he disguises himself as an angel of light. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14. He does that at times. He is crafty. He is a master of packaging sin to make it look appealing. That's what he does, beloved. Somebody's going to marry an unbeliever. You know that's not right. But we'll work it out. But I know he'll love me. But I know that we will. I'm just so confident that God will save them after we're married. And you're sitting here and you're thinking, how foolish that sounds. Because you see the whole thing for what it is. But the people involved do not. That's what he does. Packaging sin to make it look appealing. Do you really think he's going to throw out there all the consequences for you to see and let you make a decision yourself? Don't be naive, beloved. This is what he does. He's a liar from the beginning. John, Jesus says in the Gospel of John. So here, and here is a great difference between how God and Satan deal with those people who follow them. God reveals to us, his followers, the strength of the enemy. God's word tells us about Satan. Paul exhorts us, do not be naive to the tricks, to the deceitfulness of Satan, to the enemy. Do you think Satan does that to his followers? 
Does he point out the power of God to those who follow him? No. In case you were wondering. Satan does not dare to reveal to his followers the strength of God. Or they would mutiny, of course. Paul speaks of Satan's schemes in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. That word schemes there is a term that implies craftiness and cunning and deception. The sign above Satan's path is always marked heaven, but it always leads to hell. That's how deception works. He sells, quote unquote, he sells sin by putting forward the immediate gratification and concealing the eternal cost. He sells things by concealing the eternal cost and he puts forward the immediate gratification and all of its flowers and all of its pleasant aroma and all of the short term benefits. That's just what he does. And over and over again in Scripture, we are warned, we are called to not be naive to how he works and what he does. Satan is a genuine believer. He is, surprisingly enough, he is doctrinally sound and theologically orthodox. Yes, he is. And James confirms that he believes in God. In fact, Satan is far more orthodox than an atheist. Only a fool says God does not exist. And Satan himself knows that God exists. He is far more orthodox than liberal theologians who deny the deity of Christ. Satan knows the deity of Christ. He knows that. So you see, he is far more orthodox than most people living on this earth. And for all of that, Satan's belief is only an intellectual assent. It is only an awareness. He does not submit to the truth that he knows in his mind. He does not submit to the authority of the Father. He will not bow of his own volition. He will not bow the knee to the deity of Christ and worship him. He does not submit to the truth. His entire being is to oppose, to twist, and to pervert the scripture. He refuses to submit to the authority of scripture. He knows scripture, and we'll see that in the next couple of weeks. He quotes scripture. He knows it. He knows it so well that he knows he's pulling something out of context to get you to try to do something. Which is one of his greatest weapons. Pulling something right out of the middle of context and somehow convincing believers who have not studied, who should know better, that this is true or that's true or this is this is the way it should be, that's not the way it should be, and it's completely out of context. He's a master at doing that. And there's a large portion of Christianity in the world that he has in his hand because he has convinced them that, they, that if they just give money, God will return it double back to them. And so there are some people who actually don't pay their bills but give their money thinking that God will return money back to them. That's just one illustration. There are tens and 20 and 50 or more illustrations of things like that that Satan has taken out of context and convinced people that it's true. It's just what he does. Never forget that. That's why, that's why the Bereans are so commendable. Everything that they heard Paul say, they opened the scriptures and they saw and they examined the things that they heard to make sure that they were true. Satan is a world ruler. He is 
the leader of the worldwide conspiracy involving a hierarchy of demons. There were several books. I think there's like three books. Remember Frank Peretti? Three books. Piercing the Darkness, I think was the first one. Um, You know, when I was going to seminary in 1989, driving the truck out there, my wife read that first book, Piercing the Darkness. She'd read it out loud, and I would drive. And it was an interesting book. Fiction, please understand that it's fiction. But what these books, the impact these books had on some people, on some churches, on some denominations, was that it became not a fiction for them, it became a theology for them. And they began to, uh, that seemed to resonate with Scripture, Daniel seemed to resonate with all kinds of, of things that they might see in Scripture, and so off they go. Casting demons out of this room, out of that city, out of this, that you have the demon of, of uh, laziness, you have the demon of whatever it is, just bizarre stuff. He is the leader of a worldwide conspiracy involving a hierarchy of demons. But there's nowhere that I see in Scripture where you have the authority to cast out a demon. What makes you think they're going to obey you? Satan does control this world system, operating independently of God, and he is hostile toward God. He is the ruler of this world. John chapter 12 and John chapter 16 says he is the ruler of this world. And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, John says in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Paul called him the God of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. The prince and power of the air in Ephesians 2 and verse 2. Incidentally, in that passage in Ephesians, remember, we were dead in trespasses and sins in which we formerly walked according to the prince and the power of the air, according to the customs of this world. We were all under that. Now, I doubt anybody would say here, I don't remember serving Satan before I became a believer. But according to Scripture, you were. Because you can't have two masters. Either God is your master, or God is not, and then another master will come come in and direct you in some way. He is the God of this world, the prince of power of the air. His dominion, no doubt, his dominion is nonetheless under the sovereignty of God, under the sovereign control of God Almighty. Where do we go to learn that? Job chapter 1 and 2. We see there Satan has to ask permission. He has to get permission. He has no authority to just go and do what he wishes. God grants him a certain, amount of, uh, a certain amount of freedom to do the things. God always turns whatever it is around for his glory and for his people's good. That promise we have in Romans 8. He always does that. But God must grant permission for Satan to do anything. Satan is a miracle worker. Satan is a miracle worker. He is a supernatural being with extraordinary power to perform supernatural works. He can produce an imitation. He can fabricate things to make it look like it was a real miracle. And he can do real things. In the future tribulation, he or one of his minions will empower the false prophet so that he will... Revelation 13, deceive those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform. That kind of freedom the God is going to give him in the future. He is an extremely powerful created being, 
extremely powerful. God gave Satan permission to cause natural disasters such as fire falling from heaven that consumed Job's property. Satan was even able to restrain the flight of Gabriel as he flew from heaven to earth, delaying the answer of prayer to Daniel in Daniel chapter 9 and 10. There's, there's, I don't think there's any doubt that there is spiritual warfare going on in a supernatural realm that we cannot see. Let me tell you this, beloved. Nothing delights Satan more than when people do not believe in him or take him seriously. Now, those of you who might have been in the military, you understand this and you understand the principle that applies to all of work relationships. When I was in the military, I knew Russian equipment better than I knew our own stuff. I had to know the enemy. I had to know his capabilities. I had to be able to recognize and identify. I had to know the enemy. Nothing delights Satan more when people think less of him, when people push him off as not not real. They don't take him seriously. He's just a myth, a figment of people's imagination. He's for weak people who need religion, who need something to lean on. He rejoices when he hears that. Because regardless of what people think, he is real. And when they say he's not, doesn't make him go away. He is still real. He still captivates people. Years ago, liberal theologian by the name of Rudolf Bultmann dogmatically stated, it is impossible to use electric light and the wireless and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries and at the same time believe in the New Testament world of demons and spirits. German rationalism at its best. After all, we live now in the 21st century, right? We have all these electronic devices. Are you serious? You still believe in some spiritual ancient myth written thousands of years ago by guys who were uneducated Jews living in this hot, arid place? Yes. Because the scripture says so. Scripture is not confusing. It's not vague. It's very clear. He is real. Satan and the demons are not just an impersonal force of evil in the world. The devil is not just a figure of speech or the figment of the primitive minds of the biblical authors. He is a real spirit being. He is a created angelic being who rebelled against God and led a number of angelic hosts with him. Led them in his rebellion. Satan and the angels that followed him are evil to the core. To the core. Run. Don't think lightly of. Contrary to some TV programs where nice witches have supernatural power to do good, all satanic and demonic activity is wicked. It is wicked. I didn't say it wasn't real. There are lots of stuff going on, but it is all wicked. This is this person that Jesus is going to face. The tempter, verse 3, and the tempter came and said to him. This is after, towards the end of 40 days of fasting. He's had only water. If there was a physically weak condition, he is in it at this time. There's much more that we need to say about the nature of these temptations. Are these temptations unique to who he is, the Son of God? Or are these temptations the same that you and I would encounter? There's many more things that we need to, to investigate in the next couple of weeks. 
But how are we to prepare ourselves? How are we to stay sharp? Well, Ephesians 6, keep the armor of God on. You stay in the word, beloved. And invariably, when people say, well, I'm struggling in my walk with the Lord, almost always, when you ask them the question, are you spending time every day reading the word and in prayer? Well, no. Bingo. There's the first clue. That's probably a good reason, a significant reason, why you find yourself struggling. Not that reading scripture makes all issues go away. We're not saying that. But you've got to stay in the word, beloved. You've got to stay in the word. You've got to continue to memorize and read and meditate upon Scripture. Satan hates that. You've got to battle not only him, but your own laziness, your own flesh. Proverbs 24.10 states, If you are slack in the day of distress, your strength is limited. Just as in the military, the time to prepare is not when you go to war. The time to prepare is now for the war that may be waiting you. For the trial that may be around the corner. For the test, James 1. Or the trial that God may have for us to produce Christ's likeness in us more. Preparing for that, ready for that, always. That's what we need to do. So beloved, I encourage you. To stay in scripture, read the word of God, read it often, think about what you read. Do not, do not think lightly of the enemy. He is real, he is powerful, he has a great deal of freedom. We have the promise in scripture that he cannot touch believers. Praise God, he cannot touch believers. But if he can... If he can injure you, again, on the battlefield, if you injure one soldier, you have taken three off the front line because it takes two to take care of him. He can't take you. He can't touch you. He can't take you out of God's hands. But he can make your testimony so convoluted that you are like salt. Good enough for nothing to be trampled upon. So he's pulled you right out of the game. If he does that, he's won. He's won that battle. So stay ready, beloved. Stay ready. Stay in the word. Stay in prayer. Be ready. Not only for the enemy, but be ready for wherever the Lord might call you. Wherever your God might call you to serve. Be ready for it. Okay, I get a chance to... to, uh, I get a chance to teach Sunday school. Okay, I'm going to start reading scripture every day now. I'm going to start doing everything. No. You should be doing that all the time anyway. Stay in the word, beloved. Stay in the word. It's the best defense. Keep that armor on. Keep the armor on. Father, thank you for your blessings this morning. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you, Father, for this passage. We see in this passage a great test. Father, we are rejoicing that our Lord passed the test, that he overcome, he overcame the temptations from Satan. Father, we ask for your strength. We do have an enemy. He is real. He is powerful. And he seeks to dismantle our testimony. He seeks to make our testimony in our lives to be of no effect, of no impact on those that we are around. Father, strengthen us that we would not sin against you. And strengthen us to be ready for whatever calling you might offer, for whatever blessing you might give, whatever opportunity may come before us in your good providence. May we be ready May we always be ready. Strengthen us, Lord. Grant us moment by moment victory for your glory. These things we ask in our Lord's name. Amen.